Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us to learn about the Tanzania trip. Um, uh, it's great to see some uh, familiar faces and some, uh, well, familiar names, some new names. Uh, and uh, we know that it's, you know, Saturday mornings are uh, actually Saturday afternoons are pretty prime time. So thank you so much for, um, you know, taking the time to learn about our Tanzania trip. So uh, the way we're going to do this is that um, I'm going to just uh, go over a couple introductions. Hi there, Casey. <laughs> um, I'm going to go over a, a few introductions Hi. here. And um, and then uh, uh, Lori, who's a trip leader, uh, she's going to introduce herself and she's going to talk about uh, the Tanzania trip overview and tell you stories about uh, her experience um, uh, leading trips. And uh, and then what we'd like to do is have you save all your questions until the end. And uh, you can um, you know write them on a piece of paper or you can utilize the chat feature, put your questions in the chat, and then uh, we'll have some interactive time towards the end. So you could talk to me and, and Lori, um, but we'll, we find that this just helps expedite the whole process uh, so we could keep it, we try to keep it in an hour. Um, and then also it is being recorded because there's quite a few people signed up on uh, the registration list that can't, couldn't make the actual uh, meeting. So we're gonna send this recording to them so they, they can take advantage of your questions and our answers. Um, so with that being said, my name is Tara Short. I'm the founder and CEO of Green Adventures Tours. This is my 14th year offering adventures for uh, uh, ladies like you and the men in your lives. Uh, and then also I do student trips as well. Um, and uh, we started leading Tanzania trips in 2019. Or was it 18? No, it's 2019 was the first, yeah, first trip, sorry. Uh, no, it was 18, wasn't it? What, I, 19. I can't, 19, sorry, all of a sudden I just like, the, you know, 2020 screwed everything up because like that, that I'm like, what year is it? So yes, uh, 2019 was, was the year we had our first trips to Tanzania. Um, and I went there in 2018 to scout as part of an extension to scout Uganda. Um, I wanted to go to Africa because my, my heart was to go see, I wanted to see a dream was to see mountain gorillas. And um, when I was deciding to go to Uganda, I decided to look at a map and I saw that Tanzania was right next door. And I thought I should probably go to Tanzania and, and check this out too. And I remember thinking, what does you got, what does Tanzania have that Uganda doesn't have? Because I, my experience in Uganda was amazing. So flying over to Tanzania, I thought, well, they don't have the apes, you know, they don't have the primates. Little did I know, it's a completely different experience and it is like absolutely um uh, uh it's soulful um it's it feels like the the, the quintessential um uh, safari experience and um uh, i think the thing that really stood out to me most in addition to the cultural experiences was the very first time we got out onto the serengeti and saw hundreds, maybe thousands of wildebeest and zebras all together migrating across these great plains. And I'm a kid of the 80s. And immediately what I thought of was the never ending story where uh, um, uh, Bastion is riding on the luck dragon over uh, um, uh, Fantasia after Fantasia had come back to life again. And he said, it's like the nothing never happened. Um, and that's what it feels like to be in the Serengeti to me. It just feels like everything before we screwed it all up. Uh, there's a balance of predator and prey and um, you get to see so many animals in one line of sight. So um, the Serengeti is just one small part of that. And I'll let Lori talk about the different parks, but uh, Tanzania definitely captured my heart. And um, I, 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 I left there going, everybody needs to do this. Um, so uh, uh, Lori, do you wanna do an introduction now or do you, do you, want, you wanna go into the slides? I'm gonna share the screen, go into the slides okay. and um, okay. let you continue for um, a little bit sure. more. Yeah, great. So um, real quick, Green Adventures offers 13 destinations um, and all of these de destinations are because of women who have gone on our trips. I started leading women's trips in 2010. I started Green Adventures for high school science teachers and their students. And then in 2000, I did trips in 2009, then 2010, uh, we had our first women's trip with the, a program called the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program. And they said, hey, Tara, would you run trips for, uh, for our 
for our, our ladies uh, in Baja. And I said, I'd love to. So that's that first trip though, um, after that was over, the participants were like, where are we going next, Tara? And so I just started adding destinations based on the demand of those, those participants. And that's why we have all these places. And many of these places were just dream experiences of mine that I knew would resonate with the people that are in our community. And um, so today, we still work with science teachers and their students. We don't offer all the destinations to them, uh, but we work uh, with women's travel programs. And some of you may know we do co-ed trips. And so we do have a co-ed uh, offering for the Tanzania trip. And um, that is, you know, men, men and women uh, that can participate in that. But Green, oh, sorry. Green Adventures is um, uh, our mission is to help protect people, places, and ecosystems. And that came from this quote. Uh, when, I was an, uh, when I was just, I'm still an environmental educator, but when I was just an environmental educator, before I had a business, this quote inspired me. And it was by, um, a, a, he's a conservationist uh, from Wisconsin, Aldo Leopold. And he said, we abuse land because we see it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we all belong, it's then we'll begin to use it with love and respect. So I have, taken that ethic, which is let's talk about that everything is connected and related, but um, the other aspect of it is that I want people to love a place. And because if we love and respect it, we'll, we'll protect it, right? So uh, through Green Adventures, I do what's called wow, wonder, and world citizenship. So many of our destinations, especially those who have you know the big animals um, and, and national parks that need to protect, be protected, um, we use, um, uh, we like to wow people with an extraordinary animal encounter or an extra uh, extraordinary place. We want to help them ask questions and inquire and have it, 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 um, develop that sense of curiosity and then world citizen citizenship. What can you do to pr protect this place, no matter where on earth you live? And a lot of it comes down to just the choices we make every day in our own home states, in our own backyard. And we can we try to teach you about those things on, on our trips too. So with that being said, um, we're gonna, Lori's gonna take over from here. But one of the things I do wanna just ask again, since some of you just came in, um, if you could turn off your cameras, that helps lower the bandwidth so we don't have any hiccups with the technology. Also remember to keep yourself muted. And then at the end of this presentation, uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions if we haven't covered everything. So Lori, take it away. All righty. Okay, I'm Lori Anderson, and I'm the trip leader on this Tanzania trip. I actually, Tanzania was my first trip with Green Adventures, and I um, traveled as a solo traveler. Um, didn't know Sol, hadn't met Tara, hadn't met anybody, and it was an unbelievable experience. Um, since then, I've uh, I would say I'm slowly ticking off all the trips on our roster, but I probably should say I'm quickly ticking off all the trips on the roster. I, I think I have three more to go and then I can say that I've done them all. Um, and anyway, I have a passion, extreme passion for all kinds of travel um, and an extreme passion for meeting new people and um, learning everybody's story. So here's uh, where Tanzania is on the map and um, the equator is uh, you know, right, of, right, of, right about where that arrow is. Um, so we're, um, right near the equator on, um, on this entire trip. And let's talk a little bit about like, you know, what does it take to get there? Um, many, um, if not most of the major airlines here in the US um, can get to Tanzania. The connections are through um, usually Amsterdam or Brussels. Um, the major airlines I've listed here are Delta, KLM, United, American, Brussels Airways, um, you may find other flights through Ethiopian Airlines, um, you know, some of the um, African Airlines. Um, it'll take about 24 hours of travel. Um, what I found, it's about a seven, eight hour flight from Chicago to Amsterdam, a little bit of a layover there, and then another seven or eight hour um, flight to um, Arusha. And then add in, you know, just time that, you know, getting to the airport, et cetera, and you've got about 24 hours total. Seems like a long time. It's worth it. Absolutely worth it. Um, looking up the cost today, um, it's running about $1,000, $1,300 round trip uh, from uh, the Chicago area. Uh, that doesn't include if you need, you know, if you need to pay extra for baggage, things like that, or um, if you wanted to upgrade to a something better than a, um, uh, the seat, the coach seat. Um, all of the travel parameters um, are provided by Green Adventures. We keep you well informed of 
when to start uh, booking your flights. Um, we uh, wait until we have critical mass for the trip, until we have our minimum that we need to run this trip. And um, the minimum uh, for Tanzania is eight. Um, when we also have a travel agent we can connect, connect you with to help you uh, make all of those airport arrangements. And the beauty of that, of working with um, that travel agent is should you have any flight delays at any time going to or, or getting to Tanzania or getting back home, um, a simple phone call to her uh, will help um, straighten everything out for you. We highly recommend that. Um, entry and exit requirements. Um, you need a valid passport, a couple of blank pages um, in it. Um, the tourist visa for Tanzania is currently $100. The application can be done um, completely online. Um, that's uh, new uh, within the last year that they've um, moved to an online um, service for providing that. You have to remember we're working with a third world country and, um, and there are sometimes hiccups, but uh, we, we finally got to um, online visa application this year and, um, and then it was a piece of cake. Um, at the moment, um, uh, uh, Green Adventures does not require vaccinations. Um, and uh, Tanzania does not require anything at the moment either, um, either getting there or returning. Um, so obviously that could um, change um, and we will keep you advised of, of any of those changes. Oh, I often asked um, what, what, other, um, you know, what other shots or um, medicines do you need? Um, we also recommend you check in with a, um, a, a travel nurse they have uh, great information. They'll ask you exactly where you're going and, and um, can tell you what um, shots you may need to get up to date with. It's different for everybody, depending upon your medical background. Um, they will for sure um, uh, want you to get a prescription for malaria. And um, depending upon which, which prescription you get, you start taking it a couple of days before you leave the US, take it throughout the duration of the trip and take it for another week after you return. All right, moving on. Uh, what else? Okay. Um, yeah, you may be traveling solo, but you're, you will not be alone. Um, from the get-go, I'm your first adventure buddy. And we work really hard to support you to get ready for your trip, a detailed packing list, um, entry requirements, um, highly recommend getting travel insurance. The uh, local guides will be um, waiting for you at the airport when you arrive. It's easy to find them. They identify themselves. You'll see Green Adventures um, logos. Um, and they are also with us 24-7 um, um, on the, the entire time. They also get us back to the airport um, when the trip is over. Um, we have 24-7 on-site support with um, uh, Tara and the team um, back in the US and, uh, and the travel agent as well. And this also goes for any um, illness or accident might happen. Um, you, you're not gonna be left alone. Uh, we will get you uh, the support and anything that you may need in that regard. Um, this note here about arrange for necessary tests to return to the USA, um, nothing required at the moment, but in the last couple of years um, of COVID, uh, we, arranged for, uh, we arranged for the uh, PCR test that was needed before you flew back to the US so that nobody has to worry about how to accomplish any of that. We travel as a group, we do everything as a group. So here's the local team. Um, this gentleman off here to um, off to the left side of the screen is Barraza, and he owns Montango's Expeditions. And there's the other two guys, Corrado and Vitalis, and uh, they're with us the entire time. They're trained naturalists. They know animal behavior like you would not believe. Um, they can spot animals, birds, reptiles, you name it. Um, uh, at any time and at any, uh, at any, no matter how fast the vehicle is going, it's amazing the vision that, that these guys have. They're also um, very um, happy to, do, to talk about culture, the history of Tanzania. Um, there's no question you can't ask. Um, they are happy to share um, everything about Tanzania. This is an example of what a safari vehicle looks like. Other uh, land cruisers and the uh, roof pops up um, uh, for uh, great unobstructed viewing. Um, you can stop, or you, I'm sorry, you can stand up and, uh, and get a really free uh, 360 view. 
the seats are such that um, everybody has a good seat. It fits six people in the back behind the driver. And um, you can see there's a seventh person sitting up next to the driver. Um, if for whatever reason you decide you might want to sit there. Um, I've taken advantage of like moving all around and um, sitting everywhere if there's no bad seat. Here's a picture of uh, Sarah um, and uh, the great view that she has of some giraffes. This is an example of what the luggage looks like as we're moving around. And you'll see the packing slip um, specifies duffels and no wheels. And this is super important because we are often staying um, at a lodge or a camp for only one or two nights. And then we're on the move and everything comes with us. And it all has to fit in this little area in the back of the land cruisers. During the day, none of this luggage is accessible to us. Um, what we have um, will be with us in a um, day pack, uh, water, uh, you may carry a rain jacket, another layer of clothes, um, bug repellent, a first aid kit, a toilet kit, things like that will be in your day pack. But this luggage that's in the back of the Land Cruiser as we move from one location to the other is not accessible during the day. So the no wheels thing and, and no hard sided suitcase, super important so that everything can um, squish and fit back in here. This is a great example of like what type of clothing to wear. You'll notice the colors are um, muted and uh, what, we, what we call that is all forest friendly colors. We don't want to, um, or I should say we do want to blend in with the environment as much as possible. Um, uh, that's so we don't um, uh, alarm any of the animals that are nearby. We want to um, blend in and be inconspicuous and um, be as much a part of their environment as possible. So forest friendly colors. Uh, we want to avoid um, black or navy blue. Um, Tsetse flies are attracted to those two colors. And we know in some of the areas of Tanzania, Tsetse flies are more prevalent than others. Um, we let people know um, uh, the night before how to dress for the next day if, if it um, needs some uh, change up in what we've been doing. Um, strongly recommend hiking boots. Um, while this trip doesn't have a lot of long hikes or anything like that, um, you are going to be um, moving, like if we stop for lunch in the middle of the Serengeti, you're in the middle of the Serengeti and you want your ankles protected against um, uh, whatever may be in the tall grass, you know, it could be um, safari ants, et cetera. Um, it's uneven ground. So yes, uh, wear um, hiking boots um, and um, uh, wool or alpaca socks are good. And then this um, uh, bottle off to the lower right is the bottle of permethrin. And um, you'll want to get that ahead of time and spray your clothing. That's also one more layer of defense against um, mosquitoes and bugs and TT flies and um, whatever else. Um, here's a, a slide of uh, some optional things. Binoculars um, up here, strongly, strongly recommended that you have your own set of binoculars. Um, you're going to use them every day. Uh, we recommend a strength of um, eight by 42. It's great weight, a great strength, um, but you definitely want your own binoculars. Um, moving down um, to the lower left, that's just an example of uh, a carrying strap for your binoculars. I forget, the, uh, what do you refer to as Tara? The binocular bra, something like that. <laughs> Love that, but that gives you hands-free um, uh, use of the binoculars. Up in the upper right-hand corner, if you wanna bring something uh, more powerful than your phone, you're certainly welcome to. You don't need to. Uh, the phones these days take incredible pictures. Um, uh, I believe Tara will tell you that the uh, pictures that are on the website are from her phone camera. Um, my, the pictures that I have throughout this slide are a mix of, of off my phone and from an SLR camera. Um, if you don't have, if you want to take a, an SLR camera and uh, you either don't have one or you want to beef up to a bigger lens, you can also consider renting one for the trip. All right, our travel plan, where are we gonna go? Um, we're going to hit a number of um, Tanzania's national parks and um, the Ngoro Girl Crater, Olduvai Gorge. We, during the duration of the trip, we visit four indigenous tribes, the Maasai, 
two different groups within the D D Toga and, uh, the, and the Hadzabi tribes and then uh, and national parks. And I'm going to kind of go over those one by one. Okay, our accommodations. Um, this is an example of the places we may stay. And if you go to the website, um, there are live links. Um, if you want to get a better, a uh, uh, closer look at what the lodging looks like. And uh, this is just an example. It may get switched up as, on the actual trip. Um, we may find that we're two nights at the Marrera Valley Lodge and, um, and then on to the Serengeti. And it, it all has to do with the availability um, uh, of the time of our trip. But the lodges are all great. They're four star eco um, lodges. The uh, what the lodges are are individual permanent buildings. So you and your roommate will um, share a room. Um, more often than not, they the beds have um, mosquito netting, and all of the lodges um, also have a shower, running water, uh, flushing toilets, and a sink. And the tented camps are um, there to me. They're those are like a dream come true. They're um, I like to call them like semi-permanent camps. It's um, they're there to stay for the throughout the season, but they can be taken down and moved by the um, uh, tent companies. And believe it or not, these um, tents also include inside each tent a separate bathroom with a shower and a sink and a flushing toilet. So all of our accommodations throughout um, are um, pretty amazing. And here's a couple of examples. Um, I just love mosquito netting. I think it's absolutely dreamy and, and functional, protects you from getting um, bit by from anything at night. And this picture in the middle is an example of the um, common area at uh, the Serengeti tent camp. Um, it's our dining area. And this is the example of the tent camp out on the Serengeti. Uh, middle of the night, you may hear the sound of lions. You may hear Cape Buffalo snorting. Um, you may wake up to see a hippo in the front yard. Uh, it's, you are right there. You are in the middle um, of, the, of, uh, of these uh, parks. They're not fenced in, the animals are, are right there. Okay, our first stop um, is Arusha National Park. And um, Tanzania has 22 national parks in total. And this one is like this little hidden treasure. So it's, I, we've been there sometimes where we've never seen another vehicle. It's just the time of year that we go. And this is a um, lesser traveled park, but it's an absolute gem. Um, it gives us our first um, insight into what um, seeing the wildlife is like. And there's um, an area just called the Small Serengeti. And that's where you, you, know, you start to see the animals, um, giraffes, Cape buffalo, zebras, warthogs, um, get an eye for looking for the monkeys up in the tree. Um, almost, uh, almost guaranteed we'll see the colobus monkeys. Um, this year we saw blue monkeys, uh, olive um, baboons, uh, just amazing. And bird life in this park is super prolific. You're a birder, um, have a keen eye out. So here's just a few examples of the things that we saw in Arusha. Um, huge area of flamingos, giraffes, the giraffes are all over. Great watching those. Collective nouns for giraffes, if they're standing still, it's a tower of giraffes. If they're on the move, it's a journey of giraffes. Here's a stork, drying its wings. Okay, our next day is at the Ngorogoro Crater. And the crater is amazing. It was formed millions and millions of years ago when a volcanic eruption collapsed and it left behind this huge um, caldera. And you enter the crater um, from up above on the rim, and then we slowly make our way down on this um, dirt road, um, zigzagging back and forth down, down, down. Um, when you're up on top of this crater and you look down, you're like, um, I don't see any animals. And they're like, yeah, there's like 300,000, or excuse me, 30,000 animals down there. And it's super hard to believe because you're up so high, you can't see a single thing. And then pretty soon we get down there um, and in the bottom of the crater and we start to see um, animals all over the place. There's a pair of um, crowned cranes, beautiful bird of Tanzania. Um, 
everybody's anxious to see the big cats, but the smaller cats are just as fun to spot. In the upper uh, left-hand corner is a caracal cat, and in the bottom right is a serval cat. And uh, they are pretty am amazing to spot and watch as they're um, hunting through the, through the grassy areas. Um, in this slide here, the lions in the crater um, have black manes, and that's unique to the lions that are in the crater. So always fun to find um, those guys. Uh, plenty of zebras and wildebeest in this area. The zebras and wildebeest in the crater are not part of the Great Migration. All of the animals that are in this crater pretty much stay in this crater. They don't migrate in and out. And um, there are also um, an abundance of elephants. Next day, we're off to the Old Dubai Gorge. Um, amazing um, location to spend some time at. It's a deep ravine. And this is the place where um, uh, archaeologists have found um, the first evidence of humans, the first traces of mankind. And it's um, it'll just give you goosebumps to sit in the amphitheater that overlooks this deep ravine. Um, we have a, um, a small talk. Uh, a lecture on the history of the place, of this place. It's, you can't believe what you're seeing. You can't believe um, who has walked here before us. And they have a great little museum um, with uh, uh, samples of skeletons, tools um, that have all been found in this area. That's just the entryway um, to Old Dubai Gorge. Maasai Village. Um, we have a great interactive day with meeting the Maasai people. Um, their um, uh, culture is interesting. They're very, very proud people. They have very interesting um, dances that they demonstrate and want you to join in and want you to give everything a try. Um, they will demonstrate how to make fire. They, we then enter their village and uh, a tribesman will take uh, two or three people at a time and uh, take you inside their hut. They're tiny little huts. They're made out of cow dung by, and um, inside is just one, one large room, one small room. You can see where they sleep, where they cook. Um, it's prob you probably have walk-in closet that is bigger than the, that this, the entire house that they live in, um, but they're a happy people and, um, anxious to show off their way of life. Uh, we also visit their school room and it's, uh, it's an absolute high point of this day to see the children um, demonstrate what they've learned. They're learning um, English um, and they are happy to let you know they know their ABCs and how to count. Um, they also have within the village is also a small market of um, their handmade items. There's um, car carvings, small bowls, a lot of beaded work. They do extensive beaded um, bead work, and um, you can um, negotiate for something at their market. Here's a few um, uh, images of the Maasai people. They um, wear these plaid um, blankets um, draped over them. That's distinctive of the Maasai. Here's the children in their schoolroom, all ages in one schoolroom. And then here's a glimpse of um, some of the items that are available at their market. Prices are negotiable, which is kind of an interesting process all in its own. Next day, we're off to the Serengeti and we spend three nights on the Serengeti. Serengeti is huge and no trip to Africa is complete without spending time on the Serengeti. Um, the highlight is the great migration of wildebeest and zebras. Um, at some point during those three days, we uh, try to catch up with that migration. It's a huge um, counterclockwise circle of wildebeest and zebra that are following the rains and following the fresh grass. And they travel hundreds and hundreds of miles across Tanzania, up through um, Kenya um, in a large, large circle. And they just keep making this cycle over and over again along the way. Um, they give birth along the way. Um, it's dangerous. There are, you know, lions and cheetahs and leopards um, following as well, uh, or along the way. 
uh, but it's it's unbelievable to witness this great migration. I have a little video coming up as well. Um, you never know what you're going to see. Uh, every day is different. And what I realized this year, what I love about the Serengeti is I remember growing up um, and uh, my parents had a cottage in central Wisconsin. And at the end of every day, we would go out and try to find deer. We would go out looking for deer and you would you know, come around a corner and who would be in the first one in the car to see deer out in the field. And we were only looking for deer and I was thrilled. And I realized this is what I love about a game drive. It's like looking for deer on steroids. Like who's the first one to see an elephant or the first one to see a uh, hyena or whatever. And um, every day on the Serengeti is, is different, completely different. Um, it's important to watch, you know, not just the um, fields and the roads in front of you, but to watch the skies for vultures. They're a good sign that, they're, um, that there's activity on the ground, that there may have been a kill recently, and um, they're waiting for their turn for a bite to eat. The birds in Africa, unbelievable. I was not a birder until I went to Africa and I just didn't, um, never knew about the size of birds that are out there and the different colors and they're different than any birds that I, we have here in Wisconsin. All right, here's a, a baby hippo and mama hippo. And this was taken at um, a hippo pool our guides had found this hippo pool. We get up early, crack of dawn, still dark out. Um, and the goal was to get to the hippo pool in time to see the hippos come back into this pool of water. They spend their days in the water to help them cool off, but they leave at night and then they graze out on the land at night. And so we stood there as the sun rose and from uh, three out of four directions around us, hippos were coming across the um, savanna and making their way into this water. There had to have been at least 150 by the time that we left and of every age um, and the noise, uh, the, the sound, the smell, uh, un unbelievable experience. Here's a little close up of a couple of um, juveniles. They're playing around, um, you know, testing their dominance not really hurting each other, but this happened. This was happening a lot at the hippo pool. Another th fun thing to look for are leopards. They can be hard to spot, uh, no pun intended. Um, and, uh, and they like to hang up in the trees um, during the day and they blend right in. Um, often the guides will look for uh, simply a tail draped down from the um, branches. And then, you know, we look deeper to see if we can find a leopard. And we got lucky because this, uh, this leopard um, was laying in the tree, but um, pretty soon she got up and she walked right past our vehicle, like unbelievably close um, encounter for a leopard. Um, another fun animal to see are cheetahs. And this gal, um, our guides estimate, we came across her probably about 15 minutes after this kill took place. We did not see the kill happen. And um, I don't know if I, if I do want to witness that, but I do like Tara's line of she, she wishes both sides could win, which is true. The, the, you, know, you want the gazelle to get away, and yet you need the cheetah to, and the cheetah's family to eat. So you want both sides to win. But circle of life, um, this is the real deal. So this cheetah, um, we watched her probably for an hour. And it's very, 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 very fascinating. Um, the cheetahs lose more often than they win. And even if they, even if they catch something and um, start, you know, start their meal, there are all sorts of other animals that are waiting to take it away from the cheetahs. Lions will take stuff away from them. Uh, the leopards will take stuff away. Hyenas, jackals, vultures, they're all waiting to steal from the cheetahs. And, um, and again, the cheetahs lose their meal more often than not. This is another group of cheetahs. This is um, three cheetahs um, on one kill. And what we, and here's a couple of jackals. They were right close by, um, just waiting for their opportunity. And at any given time, watching these three cheetahs, one was um, sitting up like this guy on the right, um, keeping an eye out, like who's on the horizon? Who's trying to, who's trying to take dinner away? It was absolutely um, fascinating to watch it all play out. Here's some zebras. Um, you don't see this um, 
activity too often. The, you know, zebras are usually standing around, looking around, but um, these guys were, uh, were uh, really uh, into a little bit of a tussle here and uh, uh, a lot of activity going around. So I happened to catch uh, one of them, one of them biting another, but you, we, we will see hundreds and hundreds of thousands of zebras and I never get tired of see, seeing them. Here's a small, here's a little example of a small bird that we see. This is a lilac breasted roller. Um, teeny little guy, um, smaller than our robins, and, and the colors are absolutely gorgeous. Um, when they catch the sunlight, it's uh, like watching a rainbow fly by, and uh, just love these little beauties. Here's the uh, here's the the king, right? Um, and he's sitting up on a rocky ledge. Um, if you've seen Lion King, it's like Pride Rock. You see these um, rocky outcroppings. Um, often in the Serengeti and they're called copies. And we ride by one and everybody's looking to see, is there a lion, is there a lion? And sometimes they're hidden in the crack. Sometimes, you know, the lioness and cubs will be kind of uh, much more hidden than this guy. But um, this guy up on top um, was a windy day, um, blowing his mane around. And um, he was happy to just catch a few rays of sunshine and, and soak up the sun. Here's a little video of the great migration. And um, I hope you can hear all the grunting that goes on. Um, this is an absolute sea of wildebeest, hundreds, hundreds of thousands. Um, let's give it a look. It's just a river of wildebeest. And, um, and I think I mentioned it before, the wildebeest give birth on this migration and everybody just keeps going. The little calves, everybody, they just keep going. It's, it's remarkable. And here's our group at the fence of the, or at the entrance of the Serengeti. Um, next up, we um, spend a day with um, two different tribes, actually three different tribes, the Hadzabi and then two subgroups of the Datoga. And this is a day like no other. Um, the Hadzabi tribe are a nomadic tribe of people. They um, uh, live off the land. It's like stepping back in time. They're totally off the grid. Their clothing, um, their food, everything comes from the land. And we uh, pick up a translator along the way. They speak with a very distinctive click language that um, I have been unable to imitate or, or even begin to um, accurately um, be able to do anything with it. Um, but the chief uh, uh, is very animated and um, jovial. He's um, proud, of, proud of those people. Uh, likes to talk with us, um, wants to know our names, tries to teach us a few words. They teach us about the different bow and arrows that they use, whether they're hunting for birds or small mammals or baboons or, or big mammals. Um, they take us on a hunt with them. Um, this, is, um, this hike is probably um, like the biggest hike that we have on this trip. This trip is really um, riding around in the um, land cruisers, in and out of the land cruisers all day long. But on this day, we actually go on a, on a little bit of a hike. Um, and it's so it's on uneven ground, it's through the brush. It could be different every year because these guys are nomadic and they could be in a different place next year than where they were found last year. Um, they will show us how they build fire. Uh, they, in the past, they've also often showed us uh, where they find honey and how they collect it. And they offer it up to, uh, up to us um, to have some fresh honey. Um, we get a chance to try um, uh, to use their bow and arrows and um, uh, see if we can get anything lodged in a in a tree stump uh, located a little ways away. And the women will, will show us what they look for um, in the vines and the shrubs in the area that they're in to know where to dig. Um, and they dig for a root vegetable. It looks a lot like a rutabaga and um, it's, a, it's a huge staple in their diet. Um, they're a very, very happy people. 
they um, they show us some of their traditional dances and they um, offer up the chance to join right in and dance with them. And you can't pass up that opportunity. If you get the chance, dance. Here's a few pictures of, of them. Um, you can see that they are um, the different hides uh, that they use for headwear uh, or draped across their bodies. Um, this is a young warrior, he had a hyena. Um, it, he, this is him in the middle in the um, upper left-hand picture as well. And he's got this headdress that's made from a hyena skin. And um, on the bottom is uh, we uh, gathered with all of the women of their tribe. They also have a small market um, where you can purchase some things, a lot of beaded work, tiny dolls, um, uh, things of that nature. They're a very, very, very happy people. Um, if you notice on this young warrior, you can see a couple of scars on his cheek. Um, this, it's their tradition that um, if a toddler uh, cries uh, just for attention and won't stop that habit, the mom will make a couple small cuts in the child's cheek. And when the child cries and the salty tears um, go into the wound, they stop crying. So it's a way to break them of the habit of crying. Um, and it, it, um, it seems um, harsh, but it's part of their culture and it's not, it, it has nothing to do with shame as they're adults of who may have these scars and who may not. It's simply part of their culture. The Datoga tribes, we, we visit um, two different subsets of the Datoga drive, tribe, the metal workers and the um, pastoralists. And the metal workers um, gather up scrap metal in um, the villages around the area, um, every piece of scrap imaginable, and they have a way to um, melt it down um, using a very, very hot fire that they build with a bellows and um, they have molds to shape it into a um, beginning form. And then they pound it out and cut it out and they um, create various arrows that they will trade with the um, Hadzabi the, hobby, the Hadzabi will trade meat for the arrows that they need to hunt the bigger animals. Um, and they also make a lot of jewelry, a lot of different bracelets, and those bracelets are um, for sale. Um, the pastoralists um, raise cows and corn, um, and their chief has many, many wives. We, um, we met um, both the the uh, original wife, the first wife and the youngest wife, he has lost track of how many children, grandchildren and great grandchildren he has. If you ask him, he'll simply tell you, ask the women. Um, they also like to demonstrate their way of life. You can um, take a, a turn at milking a cow or learning how to grind down the corn. Um, again, they're a happy, happy people. And um, it seems like everywhere we go, we get the opportunity to dance and um, join right in. Um, another um, feature with um, this group of people is the women often have tattoos on their faces. I have a, an example of what that looks like, and it's simply um, an emblem of beauty. Often conversation when we um, are together inside one of their huts is um, they're just as interested in seeing the tattoos that any of us may have, um, as well as explaining about their tattoos. And I, I just love that. I don't have any tattoos, but I love to see the surprise on their face when they see, you know, someone has a tattoo on the back of their neck or on their ankle and, you know, what it might re represent. And, and they're as eager to, eager to learn about us as we are about them. All right, so this, uh, this slide here is um, just an example of, of all of us wearing bracelets that we bought from um, the Datoga metal workers. And the um, uh, tribesman on the right is, um, you can see that he's creating a very, very sharp um, arrow. It has a whole row of barbs along the side of it. And the um, Hadzabi hunters use that for the larger animals that they kill if they're out for any large um, eland or um, the larger antelope. I have to tell you the story of this young woman. She belongs to the metal workers tribe. And actually the clothing that she has on right there um, is also um, uh, this, the same as the, um, the women that are in the pastoral group. I mean, they're both part of this Datoga group. Um, but this young woman, we have met every year that I've been to Tanzania. So I first met her in 2019. I saw her again in 2021. And then I was on two trips back to back leading this past year. And so I saw her every time. And so the first time that I saw her this year, um, 
I, I recognized her. Um, I have pictures of her. So I've, I've seen her picture over and over again. And, um, but, uh, and she came up to greet me. And then when she saw my face, I saw in her face that she recognized me from before. And she, her face just lit up. She gave me the biggest hug. And um, um, I'm not a crier, but I was pretty close to tears because her and I, we, we can't speak a word of each other's language. I could say hello in Swahili, but Swahili isn't her um, native tongue either. And, um, but it doesn't matter. Um, I consider her a friend. They're, they're, we've, we've passed whatever boundaries that, you know, of, of language, doesn't matter. And on, in this picture, um, when we visited them the, um, on the last trip, she wasn't at the village, but word got to her. She was you know, a couple, let's say a couple blocks away um, but word got to her that we were visiting. And as we pulled away in our safari vehicle, she came running across this field. We stopped and I got out and she just greeted me with the biggest hug, warmest hug um, ever. And so she's she's my friend. Um, all I know is her name. Her name is Mariqua. And um, I look forward to seeing her again and again and again. That's the, the beauty of travel, the absolute joy of travel. Um, here's a great example of the beadwork in their um, clothing. It's gorgeous. It's um, detailed, um, un unbelievably beautiful, and uh, a good example of this um, tattoo that is um, very common among them. It's these circles on their faces, and it's simply um, an emblem of beauty. Uh, not all of them are tattooed. Um, it's a personal preference. Um, but uh, a, just a stunning example of uh, an important part of their culture. This woman in the upper left hand, oops, sorry, upper left hand um, picture is the first um, wife of the chief. And uh, I, I forget how many wives he has, something like 10 or something like that, as many as he wants. Our next stop. Um, and our last uh, national park is Terengiri National Park. And this is another uh, smaller park compared to the Serengeti, um, but it's home to over 6,000 elephants. So we often see large um, uh, troops of elephants um, or herds of elephants um, when, we, when we visit Terengiri. Um, there are often a lot of um, termite mounds and it's great finding those. And you look to see, is any, are any of the predatory animals on top of the termite mounds, the cheetahs, the lions, um, uh, possibly a leopard. They like to um, sit on top of these mounds. It gives them a great vantage point um, to see a long distance, uh, see if there's any uh, lunch walking by. Um, we spend some time at a water hole. Um, it uh, changes rapidly. Um, we've been there when um, elephants arrive and then um, pretty soon a couple lions um, are getting a little too close and the water hole changes, elephants walk away. Um, so it's always fun to spend some time at a water hole. Um, Terengiri is home to over 5,000 species of bird. Um, if you're a bird enthusiast, enthusiast, this is where you want to be. So here's just a few pictures of Terengiri. Um, little lion, um, he was actually overlooking the water hole. And another uh, angle from the water hole, a whole uh, herd of zebras. And uh, in another area, actually along the river, we found a, a huge family of elephants. And the elephants, uh, they protect those babies to no end. Um, if, uh, if they end up walking too close to, the, to our uh, land cruisers, they will put the babies into the middle and um, uh, keep them away, keep them out of sight. Everybody works to, um, to protect and help the, the younger ones um, in their family unit. All right, what's in store for 2023? Uh, here are the dates for the women's trip and uh, co-ed trip. Uh, we can also provide a private custom trip, student trips. Um, just need to contact us um, if that's of interest to you. And um, our trip needs um, eight, eight people to, uh, to move forward. Uh, we flood you with information about the travel parameters and what you need. Uh, there's a Facebook interest group for um, Tanzania. And then once we um, uh, have a group formed for the actual trip, there's also a private um, Facebook group for, for the participants on that particular trip. We trade a lot of um, question and answers in that as well. You'll get a pre-tour travel packet. And um, I hope to see you all in Tanzania.
um, yeah, here's where to go to sign up. Uh, once again, um, early bird pricing. Um, early bird pricing is our incentive to reach that critical mass early. As soon as we reach it, people can start booking their, their um, air, uh, air flights. Um, and you can see the price goes up little, bit, little by little as the time goes by. Um, we make it easy, three equal installments. Um, before you know it, trip is paid for, and um, there you are standing in the middle of the Serengeti. Uh, that's all I have for you. Um, if you have any questions, let's see, I'm not seeing. Oh yeah, we do have some questions in chat. Uh, actually, it's just conversations so far okay. between me and Robin about how uh, I said how beautiful uh, your story was. Um, and she said, I'm not crying, you're not crying. But, <laughs> um, but if you wanna um, unshare your screen, um, mm. we can do gallery view again yeah. and give people a chance to ask some questions. Uh, we okay. got two people who are actually on the trip uh, already signed up. Linda and Sandy are already signed up for the trip. Awesome. Um, I think we just need two more to confirm. Um, I, I haven't looked at the registration just yet. But That's um, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them. So I don't know if you can hear me. I have a couple. This is sure. Linda. Um, so Chris and I were wondering, um, so how much cash do we have to bring? Because they don't take credit card, is that correct? And um, or do we get just US dollars? Or do we get their currency, which is what? Or how do you do that? Laura, do you want to answer that? Sure. Or do you want? Okay. Sure. Uh, sure. I'll I'll go. And if you, I'll any... let you field most of these uh, Q and A's regarding the. the... Okay. Um, sounds good. Um, first of all, we we will update um our um FAQ um document um that you can travel with a credit card to Tanzania. Um, I use I have an American Express card and I used it um. Uh, quite often. Um, so you can travel with a, with a credit card. Um, you can also travel with um, US dollars. Their local currency is shillings. And um, I do recommend that you um, convert some uh, money into shillings. And um, you will want to use that either shillings or US dollars. You can use at any of these markets that are uh, with the tribes, with the tribesmen, if you find anything um, of interest in their markets. Um, uh, they'll, those will want to be in cash. You won't be able to use a credit card there. But then like, where would you use a credit card? Well, you may decide um, at any one of the lodges, um, they all have um, full bars and, and maybe at night you want a glass of wine or a beer or whatever, and you can pay your bill there with either a credit card or cash. Um, so what the, type of, is it only American Express they take or no, do they? No, I happen to carry American Express, but they would take Visa or MasterCard as well. Okay. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, and the other place where you can use a credit card is um, we also stop at a market um, towards the end of the trip. And oh, I'm I'm I I will uh, get some pictures added to to that. But we do stop at a marketplace. Um, if anybody's interested in um, jewelry, um, Tanzanite is obviously super popular. Tanzania is the only place that you can get it. And we stop at some um, markets where we know um, the prices are fair and the quality is good for um, jewelry, any, any kind of souvenir imaginable. And those markets um, also take both credit cards or cash. Um, so are you thinking like taking like $400 in cash is like no, you won't, you credit card? that much? Um, I want to say I converted like maybe 150 into shillings, 100, 150. Um, and I had a little bit of uh, U.S. bills in small amounts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I do just want to jump in on that. It's just that you should bring enough cash in U.S. dollars for gratuity. Your pre-tour travel documents will indicate how much cash, our estimate of how much cash you should bring. Um, and certainly now that we're finding that credit cards are becoming more and more accessible, you don't need to bring a lot of cash. But it is always good to travel with some emergency cash. I personally travel with at least 500 US dollars of emergency cash on me when I'm across the world. Um, you just never know if your credit card stops working or you're not able to pull money out of a bank or maybe you need to go to the hospital and you have to give money up front. Um, there's just stuff that it's just, I, I've learned in my, my time of traveling to carry 
at least $500 of emergency cash. Um, so you'll carry your gratuity in cash that will be taken off your hands day one. You're, you've been on many Green Adventures trips, so you know how it works. We take your gratuity day one, so you don't have to deal with that. We distribute it on your behalf. Um, and then maybe having $150, $200 in play money, um, you know, for uh, um, purchasing or, you know, having cash for uh, souvenirs or, um, uh, just oh, yeah. very, you know, various things. Uh, and then, um, so I would say, I mean, just off the top of my head, $700 would be a good amount of money to, um, uh, to, to bring on this trip. So 500, I think the gratuity is 500. So 500 to gratuity and then $200 you're carrying with you as just extra. And you can get maybe 50 bucks in shillings from the airport, um, which all of these instructions are also in your pre-tour travel document. So you can get $50 in shillings from the currency exchange at the airport. And then if you find that you need more shillings throughout, most of the lodges can give you shillings. So you give them a $20 okay. bill and they can exchange it for you too. Um, okay. If you're gonna be using US dollars for negotiating stuff like with a Maasai tribe, you're gonna want small denominations, fives, uh, singles and fives and tens. Also, again, this stuff is all covered. So you don't have to feel like you have to write it all down is that you're gonna need money that is uh, 2000, I think it's, six, is it 2009 or 2016? It's what it's a new bills. Basically you want denominations that are new bills, crisp, no rips, no tears. Um, uh, because no writing. No writing. Um, and it's at least after 2013 is the, you know, that's the issue date on those. So yeah, it's kind of a hassle when you go to the bank and you're like, I would like $500 in, in new money, please. <laughs> But they they have it. Sometimes they just roll their eyes. So that's or they or it may take them a couple of days to get it for you. But the banks will do it. Our banks will do it. Yep. Okay. Um, then my next question is: If I get my flight on my own, like you said, through Delta, United, or American, so and it takes twenty four hours to get there. So do I have to make it so that I am there in Africa on May 9th? So then I have to really leave the U.S. on May 8th. Is that how I would do it? Yes. Yes. You are definitely going to be leaving the day before. Um, international flights are often evening flights. Okay. So if I left, got it May 8th, in, you're saying it would be in the evening, then would I be there in time on May 9th? Yeah, you, you fly... You fly, uh, well, well, you'll have to just check your flights and when they leave and when they arrive, but you will definitely need to fly earlier than the ninth. Right. I and then we'll, the it'll packet, see, um, but, does, it, does it say in the packet, like what time we need to be there on May 9th by like noon or whatever, or it'll tell us? Uh, if I recall, Terry, and you can correct me on this, but I think on the arrival day, you can arrive at any time because we just need everybody to arrive that night. We stay that first night at Lake Dil Diluti, and then we take off the next day for Arusha. Yes. So uh, most of the flights will arrive between like the latest ones will be like 1030 or 11 o'clock. And um, I mean, if you get a, a midnight flight, that makes you like, say, if you're supposed to arrive on the ninth, that makes you now arriving on the 10th at midnight. That's pretty late. So yeah, we'll have a cutoff time, just like all previous trips, like arrive by this time. Um, but it's a real generous time. And it's a time that we've been um, like, we have, have it, when you plug in the, 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 the like you're leaving on the 8th of, of on, uh, May 8th um, uh, from Chicago, uh, going mm -hmm. to uh, you know, Arusha, um, you're gonna see that it's got plus one on the reservation. So that shows you it's the next day. And then it has a time that you're leaving that next day from your connections and to where you're arriving. So um, I, if anybody is like not sure about booking flights, I definitely recommend using the, the travel agent because yeah, that would just make it easier in terms of if, if you're not, and this is in general, cause there'll be other people listening to this. It's just that if you feel more comfortable having someone else book your flight for you, making sure you arrive within those travel parameters. Um, and if there's any like flight changes or updates that she could manage that for you, it's just a $25 booking fee and it takes the hassle off of your mind. And the, the other thing you might want to consider if you're worried about the jet lag after um, that um, long of a flight, you could fly in a day earlier, you know, pay for one extra night of hotel stay 
and arrive on the 8th. So then we just pay you guys that with yes. the credit card? We can arrange that, yeah. Yes, okay. so in the, um, uh, right after the trip is confirmed, we'll send out, um, mm -hmm. uh, in, like well, part as part of that, we hear the travel parameters, hear the prices if you want to come in a day early um, and let us know if you want an extra room and we just add that to the cost of your trip. Okay. It's about $300 for the room uh, per night. There, you saw the pictures, they're pretty luxurious places. So it's about $150 yeah. a person, double okay. occupancy with breakfast. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And it's I don't think I Beautiful I relaxing grounds, really. And it's all a matter <laughs> of personal choice of, of uh, how do you feel after flying, you know, that long of a flight. Yeah, and I'm fine. So then I don't think I put when I signed up, or maybe I did, that I would like to room with Chris. So, and you probably I know think that too. I know that already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't want to hog if anyone else has a question. I think I have a couple more though. Can you guys hear me? This is yes. Sandy. Yeah, he's oh, hi, Sandy. Hi. Um, I'm so excited uh -huh. about this. I'm just really thrilled beyond. But um, in, in traveling, I just don't want to do this by myself. So I thought, I mean, I can find my way to Chicago uh, and I'll talk to the travel agent about it. And like at least traveling with someone else who's going to the same destination, that would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. All right. Cool. Um, yeah. So once we know where everybody is coming from, so uh, we'll, once the trip is confirmed, we let people know we, we will assign roommates if possible. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, because sometimes we, you know, we'll confirm a trip with eight, but we can have up to 10 or 11, we can have 11 people. So, you know, wow. after that eight, unless you're traveling with somebody guaranteed that the, the roommates like could be moved around. Um, sure. But the idea is though, we'll, we'll have a good idea of where people are coming from. And even though you may, tr let's just say you travel by yourself from like Little Rock, right? Mm -hmm. You may right. have a, con you should have a connection with one of these participants in some of these, like either Brussels or Amsterdam, Brussels, like yes. okay. that's usually where people go through. Um, okay. So. It's unlikely. I mean, we did have someone one year who was the only one who went through Brussels because everybody else went through like Middle Eastern countries mm -hmm. instead. Um, but Amsterdam is such a like it's just an, a real easy airport to navigate. Um, and uh, when yeah. you land in Arusha mm -hmm. to uh, uh, Kilimanjaro, it's a small airport. So it's not like you're landing really? in the Atlanta of Tanzania, right? <laughs> you're like, it's a small airport. And you're going to see our guys out there waiting for you. Immigration is super easy. You're going to have all your paperwork already. You're going to, uh, you you get your, t um, you can't buy your visa until three months before the start, before your travel date. So there's no, you shouldn't even start attempting to buy that until three months before your, your departure date. Um, and I you see. do that online. And, um, and then you can, um, uh, uh, yeah, and then so then once you get within that three month range, then you start the process online. You submit some documents. I actually think the hardest part of this that mo a lot of people have trouble with is uploading their documents to that to that portal. It's like African okay. countries did not make it user friendly, uh, but we all get everybody gets there. Sometimes you need to enlist like. I, I, I know this sounds horrible, but I do this myself. A younger person, like <laughs> whenever I find like I have problem with like my phone, I'm like, who's yeah. around me that's 10 years younger? Could you fix this? <laughs> um, so I, I'm not ashamed at all. It, it just comes Ooh. down to, it's not age. It's like time and desire to figure it out. Uh, and so you just get somebody else to do it. Cause it, um, the picture sizes have to be re, re like they, you can't just take a picture with your phone and send a, like upload a picture of your passport because the pic, the phones right. are taking pictures that are so um, like they're heavy, you know, they're, they're dense yes. and they have to be resized and made smaller and then exactly. uploaded. Yes. So that's the part that's kind of annoying. Um, but certainly our goal is always so that you can, we try to pair people up in, in transfer cities, especially if you're working with a travel agent, she knows who's traveling sure. where, um, be great. Yeah. But you should just let her know that you're interested in in hopefully connecting with a, another traveler. Exactly. Um, yeah. I did exactly that. I did exactly that. Um, each time okay. I went was like, okay, who also has the same layover in Amsterdam? Because sure. uh, ch chances are huge that when we all get to Amsterdam, we're going to be on the same flight going into Arusha. So awesome. it's just a matter then of communicating on the Facebook you know, group page, like, hey, mm -hmm. I'll be wearing this, I'll be wearing that, you know, I'm a short redhead, you know, whatever. And um, it's, it's kind of a, a good little um, sure. scavenger hunt. to, to Everybody gets a t everybody gets a shirt like this, too. Um, so okay. we'll all be part of the same prison camp. 
<laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we, we, it's uh, funny though, like, I, I mean, it, it's it, like I was saying in my Uganda presentation a second ago that like I don't when I wear this in Chicago it feels wrong, but when I'm in Africa I'm wearing the uniform like I, I oh, match yeah, yeah and mm -hmm. you know with it's it makes it easy for our for anybody to spot each other in the airport and then also for sure. our, our people to pick you up at the airport too. Um, I, Casey just posted that there's Qatar has a direct flight flight from Seattle that's amazing to JRO I did, there's no stop in Doha. Um, but uh, I love Qatar. I flew them with Miles last year. And that's something else too. I mean, if you guys want to play, play around with this, I now fly business class only because of Miles. And I find the credit cards to make it happen. Uh, those really long yeah. haul flights, um, they're, they're hard on my body. I, I, got a, I had a blood clot in my a DVT in September of 2020. So I'm very aware Whoa. of sitting for a long time. I know. Yeah. So sitting for a long time and, um, and I mean, I'm not a person who would uh, pay five thousand dollars for a flight. But um, if you use, if you look around for different credit cards and bonus miles, um, you can get these. You know, your bonus miles uh, just for signing up could give you a round trip uh, business class ticket. So it's kind of uh, now that's the way I go. <laughs> play, the, play the game. Play the game. Oh, yeah, yeah, play the game. Yeah, sure. Um, but uh, but anyway, Doha is also a really even though it's like uh you know a middle eastern um city or yeah city it's a, it's extremely modern dubai gets the same kind of a good rap you know in terms of a a layover city um i, I like i said more folks were actually go oh okay sorry qatar flies direct to to the middle east okay so C casey's just writing so they fly to doha and then you transfer in doha and then go to uh jaro I was just like, wow, that's they must have some real demand from Seattle to, to, to Arusha <laughs> Kilimanjaro. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, and as it gets closer, we could talk more about flights. And you know, I really don't even though we're just a few people away from uh, confirming the the, the flight. Unless you're flying on miles, I would wait it out just a little bit. Uh, there's no sense in buying tickets right now because the airline schedules change so much. The ticket you get for yeah. cheap today could be canceled in six months sure. yes. so it is it's, it's not like the past where we you know you secured your airline travel nine months a year in advance now you kind of wait it out for four months is usually a good time that i find to get get a flight um and so we, we, do want to critical, we do want to reach critical mass before anybody yes does. true we want to reach critical mass but even if we reach, reach critical mass today i'll send you out the travel parameters but i think that it's still a little early to be booking flights I see. Unless you are doing miles, because my if you're doing miles, those seats go fast. You know, they don't have like ten business class award seats in their fifteen in fifteen a uh, uh, fifteen cabin seats, right? So they only may have one or two, and those are th that's the ones. But but another thing about airline travel that that's been kind of a plus with COVID is that they're super flexible now. So even though if somebody cancel a flight, they'll give you a refund. The problem with that is that um, you could be find yourself in a situation where you now you got to find a, t a ticket that's like more expensive, right? But um, that's happening less than I, I don't anticipate that happening for your for your trip. Um, especially we're not traveling during peak times. Summertime was a, a hard time this year because of l lack of staff and everyone has their excuse, right? But it was a it was pretty hard on the travel industry, especially the airlines. But you're traveling on a shoulder season. Um, the other thing is, uh, oh, but let's just say you do book a flight. Say you find something you really love on the airline right now, and you're like, well, I don't have travel parameters, but I want it. You could, in theory, purchase that ticket. As long as you don't mind, if something changes or you want to like fluctuate, like modify your dates, like say you decide you want to come in early or you just say you don't want to come in early, they're not charging change fees. Um, and you, or if you want to cancel the flight altogether, um, you would get a credit to use on Delta or United uh, for the future. So that's kind of one of the, the nice things about the airline. In the past, you would cancel it and they're like, sorry, sign our suckers. You know, they don't help you at all. Right. Yep. But I don't recommend booking anything until I get critical mass. But the trip's not going to be canceled. We're doing great in terms of signups. And it, you have to keep in mind, we've only had it out for advertised two weeks or something. We've only been right. back from summer travel. So I, since the end of August. So I'm, I'm in the process of trying to get all that stuff advertised and, and promoted. So thank you very much for those of you who have signed up early. Uh, that's why we do the early bird, you know, incentives, because, you know, I know you have to wait, uh, but I appreciate that. You're the reasons why the, the trip gets confirmed. It will happen. 
<laughs> it will. I, it definitely will. Yeah. So my next, others? my next question is, okay, so I know you said we need the medication for malaria. So that I get from my doctor. I'm seeing my doctor um, tomorrow. So um, then really is that where I'm getting that through my physician? It really depends on your doctor. Some doctors won't prescribe malaria medication. Some physicians will require you to go to a travel clinic. And there's oh. companies like Passport Health or like Northwestern uh, Medical here in Chicago has a travel clinic. So you have to go to a travel doctor and the travel doctor will look at your itinerary and they'll make recommendations about what you need. Um, and uh, yeah, then they write your prescription. Okay. Uh, for, for example, um, for, for Tanzania, and again, this is, I went to a travel clinic and this has to do with my medical history. Um, uh, there's a there's typhoid uh ter ter i forget if it was a shot or if it was medicine and it and it's good for like five years but i forget actually how it was mm -hmm. given um, um they checked to make sure i was up to date on um all the hepatitis um shots and they checked for uh mmr and it turned out like i needed an mmr booster you know i'm like yeah. really like, what okay but you know i, I took care of all that um, they may also recommend that you travel with a prescription for Cipro, which is an, uh, like an antibiotic. And um, you'll definitely want to carry, whether you get a prescription or over the counter, you want to carry anti-diarrhea me anti medicine. Um, you know, will that happen? Maybe not, but um, I don't want to travel with that happening. And mm -hmm. I definitely, in a third world country, I want to have that um, on me. But we, we're, you are not going to see a Walgreens on every corner. Uh, you are uh, you are not going to see a Walgreens. <laughs> no, you're barely see a pharmacy. Um, right, right. And um, the, we drink um, all bottled water. We don't use in Africa. You don't use the tap to even rinse off your toothbrush. Um, everything you know, you use bottled water. Uh, so th those are just other um, medicines that you want to keep in mind. But the real key is talk to your doctor talk to a travel clinic because uh, you're going to need to do what you need to do according to your history and uh, what you know, some people may have already traveled the world and have have some of these boosters you know some some people this may be their first time leaving the continent it'll be different so where, did, where was the travel clinic that you went to Lori for me um there's a couple near me um I'm in Pewaukee and uh uh there's there's I think there's one in Pewaukee okay I went okay. to yeah so they're yeah they're they're it's, it's like until you need one, you don't even know these things exist. No, I've never heard of that before. I know. So. They're very, very thorough. Very okay, thorough. Well, I'm sure my doctor will tell yeah. me that tomorrow. Yeah. And then, yeah. then I'll figure out where to go and then do that sooner than later. Yeah, I would start looking into that. I don't know, Tara, like six weeks before, eight weeks before. Well, the good Just news is the good news is, is you don't have to get a yellow fever vaccine. And right. that, so people who go to like Uganda who need a yellow fever vaccine, I would tell them to start doing it now because there, there's a shortage. There's been a shortage for a really long time for yellow fever for some reason. For you, um, you'll get, I mean, I, yeah, I don't think you need to rush. Uh, you can, you know, I, I, when you go to your doctor tomorrow, you can discuss it with your doctor about where do I go for a travel clinic? These are things I'm probably going to need. I, I talk about your other things that you want to address. Um, and if there's any other like medications that you like, you know, when you're traveling, if there's something that comes up that maybe you're familiar with that you need to have just in case, because there won't be the option to, you know, go to a clinic when the middle of the Serengeti. Um, so if there's just medications that you want to have extra of just in cases, just in cases that you have that on you. Uh, and then, um, uh, I would, yeah, I would say about six weeks before you could start filling those prescriptions. You don't need them all right now, but you may, if there's, if there's vaccines that you need to get, maybe there's timing on scheduling that, um, you know, vaccines, the, the CDC has a whole list of vaccines. Your doc, this is why we have to say, talk to your doctor, see what's right for you. Um, I can tell you that I personally am up to date on pretty much everything, including the MMR uh, for, um, but, it, but it's funny. Well, I, I guess it's uh, the MMR is like a but, measles, mumps, rubella. It's all of them. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I was just kind of, I think it, I might've needed one for mumps as my booster, but like doing that, you know, is it the titer? Is that what that's called? Where yeah. they, they yeah, you find out what your immune, to, what your, how your immunity is. Um, it was just, there, there have been like measles outbreaks, I think in Tanzania. So that's why they're, they're saying you should get your booster. Um, so that's, that's why I did that. And I, and I travel a lot. But I also know that like, I'm up to date on the hepatitis that is, you know, like you get foodborne, like you could get it from like, yeah, handling things, but 
um, I don't, you know, I don't look for a local experience. I'm not sleeping around, uh, you know, tra like out in the, I'm um, traveling. So I don't really focus on the other hepatitis. Uh, so, I, uh, so those are the things that kind of like I talk to my, my doctor about. Uh, I will, I always have malaria uh, medication because uh, malaria, it's with you for life. If you get malaria, it's good. You'll have flare ups. It's not a fun thing to have. And we've got this, you know, so many people in Africa don't even ac have access to this medication and we do. Um, but some people have allergic reactions to it. So talk to your doctor about that. Um, we find that some people get nausea, nauseous from it. So it's better to take it at night for some people. If they, they're, they're getting nauseous, they'll take it at night. So they sleep through it, you know? So in the morning, they're not feeling poorly. Um, so those are just some minor things, but. Okay, um, Tara, uh, Casey has a question. What do the health care facilities look like? Distance quality, mm -hmm. if you're gonna break a leg, get a venomous snake bite, heart attack. It's dangerous. It is. You're in the middle of nowhere. Help can be significantly delayed. Um, there is a medical clinic in the Serengeti. How fast we can get to it uh, depends on a lot of factors. There's big rain, floods, which happens, could take us a really long time. If it happens at one or two a.m., it's it's going to be it, it's it's going to be very difficult. Um, but they do have a, a, a clinic there and they do have uh, emergency air, air evacuation. Um, there are um, hospitals in uh, Arusha, um, but most likely if something like, if something life-threatening came up, we would um, initiate your travel insurance, start talking with um, the, the, um, the, they have teams that are dedicated to helping get people evacuated. They would start communicating with the physicians and physicians uh, would be talking with um, the care team in, with travel insurance to determine how to get you to the nearest hospital that could care for you. So I wish I had a better, a better explanation, but the truth of the matter is it's, it's a third world country and we're not in the city. We're, we're out in the middle of nowhere. We're out in the middle of nowhere for the greater part of this trip. Yeah. Like in every one of the parks. And at, this, at the time of year that we go, we're ahead of the busy season, which is good because we see very mm -hmm. little traffic and you know, we've got these animals all to ourselves. Yeah. Um, and you know, Casey said, you know, she'll get travel insurance. And I did have an incident, a few. It's funny, Lori, I didn't think we'd have to talk about this <laughs> because Lori's like, maybe you should talk about what happened in Uganda. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I don't think we need to talk about that. <laughs> but, um, and it wasn't even in the wilderness. This person, she got off the plane um, and she was, are already sick to her she was sick and she was heavy she was throwing up and uh she was bedridden for a few days we took her to the uh, hospital there um they she ended up being in the hospital for the entire duration of the trip basically for 10 days in the hospital um and uh the but what was very helpful was to t i was talking to i think it was travel x uh, both travel X and travel guard. This is the reason why I like them and it is a premium to use them, but it, they just have a whole office department that is answering the phone to make these, to help coordinate this. And um, so when it came down to like, I, you know, like she's at the hospital, how do I, how do we get her home? And, you know, she didn't even know how to get home. Like if we could get her on a plane, the travel agent can move her flights, but can she can't fly like this. Like they were ready, just waiting for a doctor's order. They would have had uh, booked her a flight. They would have got a travel nurse to fly with her. They they had all the plans. So all I had to do was just make the call. Um, and um, that was definitely worth it. And of course, she got reimbursed for everything she missed on the trip. She got all her medical care taken care of. Uh, she ended up getting out of the hospital like one day before, like we went to go see the gorillas, but it was it's still kind of far away. So she decided she was just going to fly home. But uh, again, it was all taken care of. Also travel insurance as of now, um, is covering people um, if you get COVID before a trip or during a trip. So let's just say you get COVID and you can't travel on your trip. It's being treated as an, another illness so or any other illness. Um, and so you would be able to make a claim. We had a person on our Alaska trip get COVID uh, and she had to um, she had to leave the trip, unfortunately. And uh, it was 100% reimbursed by travel insurance. So there, it, it, they are covering things. What travel insurance won't cover related to COVID is if you're afraid to go because there's an outbreak, it won't cover if, um, let's just say I cancel because there's an outbreak. What I would do is I'd be working with you and you've seen, when you sign up, you see my COVID protocols, which I've been working with for like three years now, which is like a lot of if then statements. So, um, uh, and 
Um, but th those are the, those are the things they wouldn't wouldn't cover you for. But um, it definitely, if you got sick or had to quarantine, it would it would be covered. Any other questions? I don't remember what um, Chris's questions all were that she sent you, Lori. Yeah, I know it was I've, about the cash, about the. I've, um, you know, I've got them here. We can go over some of those. There's just, just a few more. She had on here on the packing list, the bug spray with DEET. Why is DEET recommended? Because DEET's a very good repellent against mosquitoes and it's the mosquitoes that um, spread malaria. And what I found, I'll tell you the difference between my first trip and my second trip is the first trip I put, I put bug spray on every day. I was like, oh, I don't give it anything, you know, whatever. Um, and then I learned from Tara, um, carry it, carry the bug spray. Uh, well, first of all, I sprayed, sprayed my clothing with the permethrin, which is suggested. So did that before I even left, but then I carried bug spray with me in my backpack and I only used it if we had a day where we were bothered by, by bugs. And surprisingly um, that it wasn't every day and wasn't very often. Um, so I used the deep sparingly, but I do carry mm -hmm. it. I carried a, a, a whatever, a, a very strong um, uh, strength of it. Yeah, I carry like a little bottle. I've never used the oh, whole thing. Right. But man, if you need it, that's what you need it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's rare. It really, it really is rare. Like you could be sitting outside having a cocktail on the deck watching zebras or something. You're like, oh, those mosquitoes are biting my ankle. Here, I'm just going to spray my ankle. Yep. Yep. But like, don't bring skin so soft, but these are like dinosaur type mosquitoes. They're not right, they're, right. They're you know, going to roll in it. <laughs> right. And, and as those of you who have traveled with Green Adventures before is what we want is you to be prepared for what, you know, what you may need. We want you to be prepared. And so that we definitely recommend the date. She asked, will the lodges have electric to charge phones and camera batteries? Yes. And in the um, packing list, we recommend um, what kind of converter um, uh, you need. Yeah, and I can I can never remember what letter it is. Like, but it's right. on the packing list. I don't either, but it's but it's in the packing list. I want to blame yeah. it. On, I'd like to blame it on the fact that I have too many destinations, but it might also be my age. I can't remember anything anymore. No, like I just I have to reference it all the time. Like, ah. <laughs> I have, I have a note to myself to actually label mine Africa because mine has a bunch of different converters. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to label this is the one that I need for Africa. Um, the one yeah, thing to remember though, you, you know, we are in a third world country. And while some of the lodges may say they have Wi-Fi, um, I think you should, um, should consider you may be off grid almost the entire time. And if you get Wi-Fi, that's a bonus. Um, the Wi-Fi at some lodges only available in the dining room. Um, you may find the Wi-Fi is good until seven o'clock at night. And then, uh, oh, by the way, the electricity may go out completely. That's why we have on the packing list to carry a, a headlamp. Um, it's usually, uh, I've seen that happen, seven o'clock, the electricity goes out and it's back on within like five or 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, third world country. And, it, and you know, that, that's actually part of the charm, right? I don't, I don't want to see a Walgreens on every corner and um, you want the charm. And also, uh, please don't uh, bring like blow dryers, uh, curling irons, because they will fry the circuits. Um, and uh, if like, I recommend bringing a hat, a bandana, uh, any of those things. Yeah, a buff. I, oh yeah, I forgot I was going to show this because I oh. this is a buff and I love yeah, it. That should be on the list. Yeah, buffs yeah. Are, I've become a huge fan of buffs. Huge fan. It's really good early in the morning because it takes a draft off your neck. Um, I've used it on a safari bad hair day. Um, covered up, you know, covered up my hair, or if it's windy, or if it's dusty, you can, you know, um, yeah, cover up yeah. these things, like best invention ever. Yeah, yeah. carry a buff. Um, I think we already covered her question about antibiotics, um, talk to your doctor. And then uh, her last question is, was interesting, is a go girl necessary or is just squatting okay? Mm -hmm. um, that's a personal preference. Yeah. Um, Wait, now, like, do you have to, like, I was gonna say, what's nice is, there's not too many options. Like only if you really, really, really need to go, do we need to stop and have you go outside the car? We, they make plenty of, there's actually lots of rest stops within the park. The park is well done. So there are like, there are bathrooms uh, at the parks. So right. um, yeah. And I want to remember, is it like, because I haven't been leading trips in Tanzania now since, well, I guess I was there in 2021. Right. But it feels like eternity when you, you, you know, you skip a year, but um, the bathrooms there are all pretty civilized, regular toilets with a couple yeah. that are porcelain holes, right? Um, actually in the, like in, in the, all the times that I've been there, there was only one restroom that had the porcelain hole. 
Um, the rest were flushing toilets. What you do want to have handy is um, carry toilet paper because the supply of toilet paper may not be adequate, but you at least have a flushing toilet. Um, and the, the guides are good at stopping at restaurants as often as possible. And, and like Tara says, they're, they're scattered throughout the parks. Now, that's also you know, like- Restrooms. Rest, I, saw, I saw you said restaurants, but st <laughs> stopping at restrooms. Restrooms. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, not restaurants. Yeah. Restrooms. No, I must speak all the time. But I thought, you know, probably because the vision of all these restaurants in the Serengeti, <laughs> no, just there's no emergency clinics, but there's restaurants. No, not <laughs> sorry about that. No, not restaurants, restrooms. Um, um, uh, and and they're they're good at making those stops. However, there may be a time where you're like, uh, hey, um, you know, and the and the code word is like, you know, we need to check the tires. And and so they <laughs> may look for um, a safe place to stop. Okay, like there have been times where we're we're in a place like where we just saw lions and they're like, uh, give us a few minutes, we're going to get to a safer spot. Okay, okay. and um, or sometimes we will stop for lunch and we have a box lunch in the middle of the Serengeti, not at a regular rest area. And that's a time where like often, you know, everybody will go, you know, behind the truck, alongside the truck, you know, whatever works. Um, do not find tall grass. That's like no. Do, do not go, this is something we'll tell you on site, but if you don't go hide in tall grass to go to the bathroom, because that's where predators are, you know, like you want to like, it'd be better just to go behind. Nobody's looking at you. They set up the cars so you can pee behind the trucks. So you just try to have your own personal moment back there instead of like trying to go where like if you in the Midwest trying to find some cover. Yeah. Um, but on the packing list too, is there's, I call it the roadside, uh, roadside toilet kit which is just a little bag that I suggest you all carry that has some toilet paper, hand wipes, hand sanitizer, uh, little baggies. So that if you do have to use the, you know, uh, uh, you have a comfort stop when you're um, in the Serengeti, you take your toilet paper out and put it in a little baggie and you carry that with you and, uh, or in your backpack and then throw it in the garbage when you get to your lodge. Um, the, other, the other thing that I was surprised at finding out on the Serengeti, finding on the Serengeti this year that I never saw before is the spot where we stopped for breakfast, which is uh, kind of along this uh, little pond that has a lot of hippos in it. Um, there was a food truck in the middle of the morning <laughs> and it sold ice cream, ice cream oh. on a stick. And we stopped there for breakfast and I'm like, I'm having ice cream because I can't. <laughs> you sound yeah. like me in Iceland, right? Like I don't, every gas station, I just, I immediately wanted gas station ice cream. It was just the weirdest thing. But it's, I mean, you're in the Serengeti, I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, how to do it. Just absolutely how to do it. All right. Um, I think that I think that covered all of um, Chris's questions, Linda. It, the, uh, the others we've answered during the presentation. Correct. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. It's a great trip. So fun. Good. Well, well, I really appreciate you all like taking the time to you know listen and um, hang out with us for the last hour and a half. And hopefully, hope these are great questions. It's all been recorded, so if anybody else wants to, you know, they may have the same ones. Um, and uh, we'll be in touch as soon as the trip is confirmed. Keep sharing so it with your friends. So will the recording like be on the Facebook site and you can click on it and hear it or you'll email us the recording? Uh, Carrie will email you the, the recording, which is going to be posted on the YouTube site. So we'll there'll always be access to it, but you'll she'll send an email to everybody with a link to the recording. Okay. <laughs> I was, uh, and I'll send the, fa I'll have her send the Facebook interest group. Many of you are already in it, but just in case those who signed up don't know about the Facebook interest group, that's going to be in there too. So the recording will be up like in a couple days or, um, uh, well, I, I would imagine, uh, within by Monday or sooner. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. in case Chris asks me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks Sarah, um, Lori. I know she'll be calling me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Sandy. Bye, bye. Thank you, Linda. Thank Thanks, you, Kelsey. guys. Have Thanks, a good Robin. Weekend. Bye bye. Bye now. Thanks. Bye, Linda. Bye, Casey. Hello, Miss.